So uh, a quick introduction to Audrey. Audrey has uh, been a lawyer for a year and a half before trying out coding and liking it enough that she's made the switch. And uh, she was uh, originally based out of Singapore, but has just moved to San Francisco to become a programmer full time. Uh, so <coughs> she's doing a talk about go for tricks. Uh, can we have a big hand, please? Over to you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, the title of my talk today is uh, Go for Tricks in Production. A little bit about me, as mentioned, uh, I used to be a lawyer and then uh, I wanted to learn programming, so I decided to pick up Go as my first uh, back end language. And I talked about this in uh, last year's GopherCon. Um, when I spoke at GopherCon, uh, I spoke in, my, in a capacity as a technical evangelist. Um, but after the conference, I moved over to the software engineering team. Um, so I'm here today to speak about how we, how we use Go uh, in production. I'm Singaporean, uh, and uh, I've also recently moved to San Francisco. That was last month. So uh, I love Go, um, mainly because of its simplicity. And I think that uh, its simplicity belies some very powerful features that you can use uh, effectively in production. So the, the aim of my talk today is to show how some of Go's unique features uh, can be applied in production. So uh, these are, this is just a quick list of some of the features that I'll be uh, touching on. First, uh, redacting data in uh, server logs. Um, you ha if you have uh, sensitive data in server logs and you want to redact data, um, let's see what, what features of Go we can use to hide uh, some of these data. Uh, we have a string method in Go. Um, if you look at uh, the node in the firm package in Go, uh, it says that if an operand implements the method string, uh, that method will be invoked to convert the object to a string, which will then be formatted as required by the verb, if any. So what do I mean? Um, for example, if you have a set of config data, um, you have the environment data uh, in, in your access key and secret key in, in this uh, config data, uh, and you want to redact uh, this, uh, the access and secret key, uh, which are confidential. You don't want to show it in your, in your server logs. Um, you can actually declare a string method on, on the config struct to automatically redact data. And uh, you see in the second block of code there, um, uh, that's how you define a string method. And uh, in the second and third line, we have reassigned the config object to avoid uh, infinite recursion. Um, and th this, is, uh, th this has been noted by, so, so there's a chance that infinite recursion might uh, occur over here. Uh, for more information, see the note in uh, the firm package. So let's look at uh, this in action. Uh, you have the config struct, and then you declare a string uh, method. Um, when you actually print the code, you can see that the you can see that the, uh, the access key is redacted uh, automatically. Uh, but if you want to access the access key, you can still, you can still do it uh, if, you, if you call the, the access key field uh, uh, of the config struct. Second, uh, environment variables. So you don't want to have uh, lots of environment variables uh, across your uh, your code base uh, and, and finding it hard to keep track of all these environment variables. So what we did was that we uh, have extr extracted them into package, uh, a package of its own. And this is an example of Go's approach to um, modularity and code reusability. Uh, we've defined a package called uh, EMB vars. Uh, inside the package, we define uh, these environment variables as a variable, uh, as, you, as you can see here. So within this package, uh, we, we can do lots of things. We perform all our checks uh, and our logic in this ENB vars uh, package. Uh, for example, uh, we, we can check to make sure that the secret, uh, to, uh, secret token environment variable is defined uh, by, by, calling a, by declaring a function here. And functions like check secret token um, or check another environment variable, they are, they are usually called in the init of uh, binary files, uh, i.e. files with package main. Um, instead of the inits of the ENV vars uh, package, and this is so that we um, this is so that binaries that don't need that have different um, 
environment variable requirements that don't require the secret token environment variable um, will not be, uh, um, uh, I mean, it, it wouldn't be imposed on them. We also use, uh, uh, we also call uh, init to set default values uh, in this env var package. So, for example, you can see that uh, we have checked, uh, we checked to make sure that uh, the email field, uh, the email variable is uh, defined. Uh, so just a quick note on the init function. Uh, in Go, the init is called after all the variable declarations in the package have evaluated their initializers. And it's commonly used to verify or repair the correctness of the program state before real execution begins. Uh, so we use this to, to check uh, and enforce um, uh, certain requirements uh, of the environment variables uh, in this package. So uh, an example of how this will work uh, is just simply uh, we just import the environment variable uh, package and then we call the variable uh, and we check that the environment variable is set. Uh, we can also change, uh, so one benefit is that we can change the environment variable easily in tests. Um, for example, uh, if you want to change your, your host name uh, in tests, you can easily just um, change the environment variable uh, of host name uh, and then use defer to restore the original state. So for more on the defer statement, uh, you can read the blog post uh, on defer, panic and recover. So uh, the advantage of putting all our environment variables into a package is that it's easier to track uh, all these environment variables. They're all in one location. Uh, all the logic, uh, the checks can, uh, relating to environment variables can be handled in the same location. So as a result, you have cleaner code. Uh, also, as, uh, as I've shown, it's also easier to change in tests. Third, uh, tests. Let's see what some of uh, our goals, uh, features allows us uh, to um, uh, let us use it effectively in tests. So functions are first class. Uh, anonymous functions may be assignable to a variable. Uh, you can read more about this in the link here. So let's see how this may be useful uh, for testing external APIs and for stubbing API return values. Normally, um, say, if you want to fetch um, the username of a user from an external service, uh, you could call, uh, you could declare a function called fetch username and then perform all your logic and then return the, the username. Um, but uh, we can actually, but that makes it difficult to, um, to stop API return values. So what we can do is that we can declare, we can make it a variable uh, and then assign an anonymous function to it and still perform uh, the same logic within that uh, anonymous function. And then in user test.go, uh, we stop the fake value in the test. So, um, so mock username is, uh, is, uh, is, is a way for us to, to stop fake value in test. Uh, and, we, and we just, so, so how, we, how we do that is, is that we would just change um, we will just swap functions by calling user uh, dot fetch username, and we swap it to mock username. So an example of how this will work, uh, um, you can see it here. So this, uh, instead of printing real user by swapping the functions, uh, it prints fake user instead. And this, so uh, effectively, you you uh, you've managed to stub out uh, this return value. Uh, there's also another way uh, to test. Uh, you might have, uh, you might remember this in the talk yesterday. Uh, you can actually use interfaces to stop return values uh, um, instead of uh, what we have done earlier. So um, you define a fake user struct uh, in a username uh, field, and uh, you declare a method on it uh, to return fake user uh, and an interface. So um, if you <coughs> so so if you change the uh, so if you redeclare um, a fake uh, if you call fake if you if you assign fake user to fake to a fake external service uh, you can see that the return value is also changed. So just a quick comparison um, when you swap functions, um, it's the approach is probably useful when you only have a single function. Um, and the interface approach useful when you have multiple methods that need to be changed for tests. 
Um, and so these two features show that uh, are useful uh, when you're dealing with external APIs um, and when you want to stop return values. Uh, so for uh, error handling, uh, same thing, uh, functions of first class, you can pass functions as arguments uh, and anonymous functions can be returned as values. So let's see how this might be played out uh, when we want to ex extract custom error loggers. So um, we use a library called LogRest. It's a, it's a very useful library. You can take a look at that. Um, and we have a custom er error logger called mail error logger. Um, and we want to log um, any um, uh, failure to send mail in our error logs. So we assign mail error logger to an error handler. The, this, this step is optional. Uh, we can later on pass error handler uh, as an argument to, um, to your function. And uh, so, error so, error so the error logger is, is called, um, I mean, uh, an example of how, how this might work is that it would be called from another package uh, and, uh, and you only have to define it once. So, it, so by passing it, it inside, uh, it will print the error. And you can see an example of this um, in this demo. So uh, you, have the error, you have the mail error logger, you pass it in the function, uh, and it prints uh, the error in your logs. So uh, one advantage of this is that you can declare an error logger once, uh, you separate your implementation logic, so, so, you, um, so you don't repeat yourself, and you can pass this logic around uh, to functions. So uh, another trick that we use is that we hash error messages. Um, we hash error messages uh, and display it to the user if it's not a HTTP error. Um, and we display this hash to uh, our user without revealing uh, implementation details. So uh, we make use of the SHA1 package from Go. Uh, this is how we call it. Uh, uh, we check if it's an HTTP error. So, um, uh, so handle error um, checks if it's, an, if it's a HTTP error, and if it's not, it calls server error, uh, and, it, um, and it hashes the error message, um, prints it onto our server logs, and we also display the hash um, to, to the user. So all we have to do is um, ask the user to copy and paste the error hash um, if, there's an, if there's a problem, and then uh, we can trace the error um, in the back end on our own. So um, it's not very difficult to implement with Go. Um, the SHA1 package from Go standard library uh, comes in uh, handy. So in closing, um, I think Go, Go has features that enable the programmer to perform powerful abstractions. Um, which can be used effectively in production code. Uh, as a result, you get readable code and, and, you, and you separate your logic. You don't have to repeat um, the same code twice. And Go's um, approach to, to packages, uh, its package ecosystem also underlies its uh, approach to modularity and code usability. Um, and its uh, standard library also offers many tools. Um, and I think that it's been enjoyable uh, to, see, um, to see how Go has been used in, in production. Uh, I, think it's a, yeah, I, think, I think it's been effective uh, in, in the way we use it in our production code base. So yeah, um, thank you.